Welcome to the Tuesday, August 2nd, 2022 meeting of the Transportation Infrastructure Committee of the Metropolitan Council. I am seeing the following council members present. Young, Allen, Bradford, Cash, Evans, Gamble, Hurt, Nash, Roten, and Swope. Um, we have a presentation uh, and some opportunity for feedback and questions with the folks from Google Fiber. But before that, we have some legislation to consider. Uh, the following items I hope that we can have on consent. If you want to pull anything, holler at me. Item RS-2022-1680. BL-2022-1374. 1375, 1376, 1377, and 1378. Any items that anyone would like to pull? Seeing no one jump up, I will read the captions. RS 2022 1680 Syracuse Soir and Young approves an application for a multimodal access grant from the Tennessee Department of Transportation to the National Department of Transportation and Multimodal Infrastructure to provide additional funding for the construction phase of the Lebanon Pike sidewalk. BL 2022-1374, Allen and Young amends the Metro Code Section 15.48.300, new water meter installation inspection charge to clarify charges for service related to meters. BL 2022-1375, Allen, Withers and Young authorizes the granting of permanent and temporary construction easements to Piedmont Natural Gas Company for pro property, certain property owned by the Metropolitan Government located at Zero County Hospital Road. BL 2022-1376, Parker Allen and others authorizes the acquisition and conveyance of certain right-of-way easements, drainage easements, temporary construction easements, and property rights by condemnation for use in public projects of the National Department of Transportation and Multimodal Infrastructure for Dickinson Pike Sidewalk Improvements. BL 2022-1377, but Withers and Young authorizes the Metro government to abandon existing sanitary sewer easement rights for property located at 1620 Corporate Place. And finally, BL 2022-1378, Taylor's Withers and Young authorizes Metro government to abandon existing public sanitary sewer main and sanitary sewer manholes and to accept new sanitary sewer main and sanitary sewer manholes for property located at 1610 Church Street, also known as the Project C Hotel. Is there a motion on the consent agenda? And second, all of those in favor? Those opposed? Any abstentions? I think we're at six, seven, eight, 10. The consent agenda is recommended, 10 in favor, zero against. That brings us to our first item. Resolution 2022-1633 by Hall uh, requests the creation of a task force to initiate a study to determine the five most probable locations for potential waste transfer stations within the county to be completed no later than July 31st, 2023. Council Member Hall, you are recognized. Thank you, Chair. And I'm glad you were in the other committee yesterday when we had a, a really good discussion about this. Um, this is just simply looking forward. Um, it's to get more information and to make sure that we're leaving no stone unturned when it comes to trying to implement that solid zero waste plan from the Solid Waste Board and to um, help out some of the things that we need here in Metro. We're looking at a situation where we know there's gonna to have to be some real decisions made here in the near future about waste of all kind, where it's gonna go and how it's gonna get there. And so more information is always a good thing. All right, committee members, I see council member Nash, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a, a thought, um, I certainly understand the necessity to kind of have some preparation where we're bumping up against uh, one landfill after another, uh, uh, deciding to uh, close. At the same time, I wonder if we're the right body to be out doing the study, looking for the property, only because at the end of the day, whatever company decides, we decide to hire, well, that, that's kind of their job to say, All right, yeah, here's where we're gonna put our, our station. And likewise, by, by kind of setting up some properties uh, I wonder if we don't increase their value or, or make, uh, you know, if, if, if I'm an owner of a property that's identified as, oh, yeah, this is where uh, the transfer station is going to go. I, I'm just curious if that doesn't jack up the property for uh, any potential vendor. Uh, Councilmember Hall. So the goal wouldn't be to specifically identify and determine that this is the location where this or type of thing should be. It's taking a look at the ones we have now, 
are we going to need more? If we need more, where would they most likely be? And that would happen under a specific set of circumstances because there's a criteria for where those things would need to be or what they would need to access. Um, everything from current zoning to um, what could potentially be rezoned for something like that, but need the need for access to um, highway and other things are very specific in the criteria. And so it's not identifying something very specific or an exact location. It's just actually looking at the areas that would be most likely and why because of the initial criteria. Council member Bradford. Thank you, Chair. So my concern with this is we we do have a crisis looming when it's with, the, with our waste system. And I feel like the efforts here are in the wrong direction. Instead of looking at wh where we should be expanding our waste transfer stations, we should be taking this time and this effort on focusing how we can divert recyclables and bio trash out of our landfills so that we don't need to expand waste transfer stations, that we don't have to expand landfills. So I would rather see waste services and anybody that is interested spend their time, money, and efforts into finding resources, finding the technology that we can re remove as much recyclable and, de and decompostable materials from our trash as possible so that we don't have to rely on waste transfer centers. Thank you, Chair. Any other committee members? All right. Um, Ms. Smith, uh, if you'd come up, I have I have a question or two or just something to confirm with you uh, as far as solid waste division at Metro Water. Uh, currently, Metro is not in the business of the hauling of, of waste or the landfill business. Is, that's correct, isn't it? Oh. That's correct. So, um, and we don't operate any transfer stations of our own, correct? Correct. All right. Oh, that, that's all I had. Uh, I guess the opinion of, of the chair, or my opinion, um, is I, I'm not sure that it is for Metro to be a site selector for a private entity. Um, I, I think when, when a company is looking for a transfer station, it depends on what makes sense for, for that, that company and their routes and where, what landfill they're using. And I guess I'm just failing to see, and I almost wonder if this isn't going to, okay, ignite a false sense of emergency and doom to say five sites are identified and now you have five sites where the folks around it are probably thinking, oh no, they're going to put a transfer station here next week um, when in fact that transfer station may never actually materialize and uh, we deal enough with, uh, you know, much ado being made over nothing and so I, I think I, I understand the some of the, the logic but I just I don't know that this is the right way to go about it. and that's that's my opinion but then Council Member Hall if you have anything else and then we'll take a vote well, um, just the fact that one we're not actually talking about landfills and I understand the conversation that with the connection between transfer stations and landfills but we're not allowed to do any more landfills and the purpose of this and the reason why it falls here is because in this process, part of what we've recently and consistently been chastised about is not being aggressive in implementing things from the solid waste zero plan into Metro code so that we would be prepared for these coming down the road. Um, there is doom and gloom looming because there's not been a real serious conversation about most of these things. And we're 18 months away from both household waste and CND not having a place to go. Um, this isn't choosing a site. This is saying we're aware that we don't want to add any more. If there was a reason or necessity to add them, where would they most likely go and why? Um, the landfill conversation component isn't even relevant in the conversation simply because, yes, it's upon them to determine where 
those things go from this operate the station to determine which landfill it goes to but we know we can't add any more landfills and we know things this is just one step in that direction we have to look at more recycling we have to look at things like gasification we have to turn over every stone aggressively looking to solve and resolve these problems so this is just one step that's why it's a study and not asking to commit any real dollars or any type of plan to something this is about getting information so that we can make the next choice in the right direction that was the purpose in creating the Solid Waste and Recycling Committee. That's the purpose in trying to get that zero waste plan. It's a 30-year plan down to 10 years or somewhere as close to there as possible. And the city's already being aggressive in terms of how we legislate and things we're pushing toward when it comes to sustainability. So this actually goes hand in hand with other legislation we've passed seamlessly and addresses an issue that is more urgent than we've allowed it to um, be discussed as. All right, looks like Assistant Director Honeysucker uh, wants to be recognized. Good afternoon. Um, Councilman, we're always supportive of you, uh, and we appreciate your support of us in, in looking at options for us to find ways to uh, succumb, to clear up this situation. Uh, I do want to remind the Council, when, you, when we're looking at transfer stations, they are just, as they say, a transfer station. That trash goes there, and then what's the next step? That's the one where the challenges really come up. Finding a place to, to transfer it out of a truck is fine. It's simple. But where does it go next? That's the real challenge that we're faced with and we're working with on a day-to-day -day basis. And we're going to always come to the council and ask for their support in helping us find a problem. But this is a major problem that we will have to address with, within the upcoming years. So with, with that being said, I, we appreciate the support of the council and we, we look forward to working with the council to try to find a, a solution to this concern. So Mr. Honeysucker, is, is that, are you indicating now the department supports this legislation? No, sir. I, no, sir. I'm just saying I look for the okay. support of the council. Because I don't see the connection between that we need a landfill and, no, and this no, no, no. legislation. This is, no, so, no. okay. This is just the support of the council as you all I have been throughout this whole process with us. All right. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Gamble, looks like you want to be recognized. Thank you, Chair. And I just wanted to echo, kind of, uh, I guess, clarify what Mr. Honeysucker is saying. It sounds like there's not a need to find potential transfer waste stations, but a need to wh where to take the trash after it gets to the transfer station. So in that regard, I'm not sure how a study, and, and maybe Councilman can speak to this, how this study would help with the, the, the real issue, which is what to do with waste, how to reduce waste, get to zero waste, and then what to do with waste that we aren't reducing after it gets to the transfer station. Hold on. Or did y'all have something before I go to Councilman Hall? Well, I do want to just uh, share with the council. Right now, we currently have three transfer stations right now. We utilize Republic as waste connections and waste management, uh, the transfer stations that we have, to, that we currently utilize. Okay. Uh, Councilman, well, hold on, I got too many mics on. Councilmember Hall. So, and, and again, this isn't to determine locations of where trash ultimately goes. What we've got to be looking at, and the reason for, again, the steady approach is simply, we know the trash has nowhere to go very soon. It has to be moved from neighborhoods to a location and then from that location out of the city until the technology portion, till the facility portion is online. If we're not doing the recycling that we should, it's gonna to have to go somewhere. If we're not doing gasification, converting the energy, it's gotta go somewhere and it should. And so we're not determining those things. What we're saying is if you're looking at a timeline and you're looking at steps that have to be followed, in order to check those boxes, we're worried about the final destination the final destination is gonna be determined, but what are we gonna do in the interim? What are the steps that we have to follow to get to that final destination point? That's why, again, if you, anyone's looked through that 300-page document with the Solid Waste Zero Plan and followed the conversation over the last five to seven years, especially after the recent decisions that we've had with our CND, this is where this comes from. Again, this is about finding information saying, 
if tomorrow both of those sites are closed. Yeah, we gotta figure out where they're ultimately gonna go. We don't get to choose that, but we do get to choose where it goes after it's collected here. And we do get to have conversations about what are we gonna do that with what we can't get out of the city and how do we get it out of the city? All right, I, I, I still think we're conflating the two totally different subjects. Uh, I mean, we, we have transportations, we're, but uh, I mean, let's go ahead, or I guess Council Member Nash. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, from, from all the discussion I'm hearing, it's not a matter of finding transfer stations. We've already got three. I, I, I think we might want to have a study about where we think the next landfill might be and making some contracts with. Um, so I, I, again, I, I certainly appreciate Councilman's uh, intent here, but I, I, I think we're uh, headed in the wrong direction, fighting the wrong battle. Yeah. I think we ought to be, if we're gonna study something, we probably ought to be looking oh. where the next landfill might uh, might be that we work with. All right, yeah, wasting time is the words I would use. All right, uh, let's go ahead and take a vote. Uh, all those in favor? All those opposed? Or I saw one in favor, and then those opposed? One, two, three, four, five, six. And then any abstentions? Okay. Well, my math isn't adding up. Councilman Cash, did you? Which way did you vote? I didn't see your hand. You voted yes. Okay. So, what did you? I have two. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, let's do that again. I felt like I didn't see some hands, or some folks weren't voting. Um, those in favor of approving, raise your hand proud so I can count them. Okay, two. Those in opposition, or those, yeah, those opposed, raise your hand proud so I can see them. One, two, three, four, five, six. And those abstaining, one. Okay, the motion to approve or is not recommended. Two in favor, six against, one not voting. All right. That now brings us, Councilman Mendez, to BL 2022-1115, and Council Member Mendez, you're recognized. So um, this is the bill that would exclude uh, federal immigration enforcement from an allowed use for license plate readers, and there's an amendment. I'd appreciate it if somebody on the right. committee could move it. All right, do we have a motion on the bill? Okay, and the amendment. All right. Council Member Mendez on your amendment. Um, uh, thank you. So I appreciate uh, Director Darby and Metro Legal um, working with me. So the amendment um, clarifies the intent that um, to the extent that anybody in Metro would be uh, seeking to verify or report the immigration status of a person, license plate readers can be used for that. Um, however, if there's a use requested um, regarding immigration enforcement that goes beyond verifying or reporting immigration status, that would be a disallowed use. And um, as it is stated in the amendment, the intent is to comply with um, existing requirements under state or federal law, which require us to not interfere with the verifying or reporting of immigration status, but to not use LPRs for anything beyond that. I appreciate um, uh, Laura Fox and Metro Legal helping um, the proposed language for me to put in this amendment and Director Darby's review of it. All right, and I guess just to, to clarify, Director Darby, this, with this amendment, that does bring this into compliance and you would consider this a lawful ordinance with that amendment in compliance with the state sanctuary city legislation. Yes, I think that with this amendment, the state is not likely to determine that this is a sanctuary policy. All right. Committee, questions, Con council, member Swope. Thank you. Um, this is a question for either Metro Legal or the sponsor. Either one of them is well welcome to answer this. But with the amendment, what does this actually do? 
Uh, um, Mendez. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to respond to that. Um, I, I think it does a lot. Um, the reality is that Homeland Security is going to already know the immigration status of almost everybody they're looking for. And so in a situation where Homeland Security absolutely positively knows the immigration status of somebody and is just associating them with a vehicle, um, then um, LPRs would not be allowed to find that person. If there were a situation where um, Homeland Security was genuinely seeking somebody out, to try to figure out their immigration status, um, then uh, under the way state and federal law reads, um, we, we, we would not be able to stand in the way of the LPR use for that. So I, I, I think the lion's share of situations um, would, would still be applicable here. Councilman Swope. I appreciate that answer, but I'm still confused. So, and, 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 Work with me here. Are you saying that if ICE comes in and specifically requests tracking somebody down who's here illegally, that this prohibits the use of LPRs to do so? Councilman Mendez. Well, we, we were told repeatedly by MNPD and the sponsors of LPR legislation that LPRs find cars, not people. Um, and and so the to, to put the question in context, all the Metro would be getting would be uh, make, model, and license plate number that it was looking for, and um, a person of interest may or may not um, be in the vehicle. And um, both state and federal law cited in the um, uh, whereas is added in the amendment um, make it inappropriate for Metro to get in the way with sending, receiving, verifying, or reporting immigration status. Um, but there, there isn't a requirement under state law that Metro affirmatively try to find an individual human being. Okay, thanks. Council Member Gamble. Thank you, and I appreciate the sponsor bringing forward this um, amendment to address that issue. As it's been stated, it was never the intent uh, for the sponsors of the LPR legislation to use it to track immigration status. That's that's not the intent uh, of what that was to be used for, and this helps um, safeguard that that intention that it is used to identify cars that have already been involved in a crime, not to be used uh, for trying to find uh, or individuals to regarding their immigration status. So for that, I um, I support this amendment and appreciate the sponsor bringing it forward in a way that we can do it legally without. Uh, without uh, obstruction of any state laws and regulations. Thank you. Council Member Nash. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And if, I, if I'm hearing right, I, I think uh, Council Member Mendez's uh, amendment does what we need to do. I want to make sure of one thing that uh, from an article in the paper last Friday, uh, conspirators kidnapped, mutilated a woman by chopping off her hand with a hatchet in Nashville after she lost drug proceeds, the news release said. A video of the attack was uh, circulated, federal officials said. Morales and Kim Birdsong, 49 of Nashville, are charged in connection with the April 4th shooting of a man referred to as Pancho or Mekina. And I don't read that off to imply in any way that the majority of our uh, immigrants here have anything to do with that kind of crime. I know my neighbors are just hardworking folks doing the best they can to make a living and, and raise their kids and, and provide for their families like we all want to. But that said, there are dangerous people that run our streets and they're not all here legally. And I wanna make sure that should someone from Homeland Security or somebody say, uh, we have information this car is being used by so-and-so that our LPRs could be used to say, oh yeah, we saw that car over here uh, Saturday at noon. Uh, and what's your opinion of, of that scenario? Councilman Mendez. 
Well, uh, I think you can take comfort, Council Member Nash. Um, <laughs> I, I might not describe the issue exactly um, the way you did. We're aligned on the substance of it. And um, from the first time that I proposed immigration-related legislation last term through now, I absolutely believe that if there's probable cause um, that exists that a crime has been committed, like somebody's hand getting chopped off in your hypothetical, then by all means, the full weight of law enforcement powers of the city of Nashville should be used to um, seek out and find somebody for whom a uh, lawful judge has found probable cause to detain the person or look for the car related to it. Um, and in your hypothetical, that absolutely would be the case. What would be inappropriate um, and what I think Nashville shouldn't participate in is if in that hypothetical, there's not probable cause such that a warrant has been issued and immigra civil immigration laws are being used as a cover to go check somebody out, then we shouldn't play ball with that and we're not required to play ball with that. Um, if there's probable cause, go get a warrant just like you'd have to for a US citizen and MNPD should go find them and use the license plate readers to, to do that if necessary. So um, substance wise, I, I believe we share the same objective there and, and I don't believe there's anything in the amendment um, that if added and we pass the ordinance that would undercut that in any way, shape or form. Councilmember Mendez, let me try and maybe I might have a simpler way of saying that and you correct me if I'm wrong. I open lawyer, sorry. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, but you're not billing by the hour to be here, so um, as an attorney. Uh, the, if federal officials are looking for someone because that person committed a violent crime or is in connection with that crime, then yes, we will share that information. If that person is being looked for due to their immigration status, then it's no way. Am I, is that an easier way to say that? That is 95% uh, right. The only caveat would be if the person is being, if, if the person's immigration status is unknown, then under state and federal law, the LPRs can be used for that. If the immigration status is known, um, we shouldn't be looking for a particular car associated with that. Okay, well, uh, I think a 95 is still an A, so I will take the 95% right. Uh, Council Member Hurt. Thank you. I'm trying to understand where the guarantee is with the LPRs, even though the intent may not be to uh, seek specific individuals or the immigrants or whatever. How can we be assured that that is not uh, going to happen without the amendment? Councilman Mendez. So, Council Member Hurt, I've, I've spent a, a fair amount of time thinking about um, whether the exception here swallows the rule. And, and the reality is, listen, if, if sworn federal law enforcement agents want to lie, where they already know somebody's immigration status and tell MNPD, oh, we're just trying to verify immigration status, so this is okay, there's nothing we can do about that. And if we don't pass anything, they can do that. Um, because state and federal law requires Metro agents to um, cooperate with verifying immigration status. Um, if we do pass it, um, it's a risk. I'm choosing um, to see the, um, uh, it, for, for those who do act lawfully through the process, then this creates a clear delineation for the rules that for strictly complying with state and federal law to send, receive, verify, report immigration status, we gotta play ball because that's state law anyway and if we tried to do anything otherwise, we'd be preempted. Um, we already are preempted. But if it's more than that and people tell the truth about um, that, then, um, then, it, then it serves a purpose. And so I share the concern, but we're in the same boat. Um, we, we might as well have the rules set up properly is how I would put it. So I'm, I'm gonna do like a uh, fearless chair and take a stab at it. So with the amendment, we have a better chance of ensuring that that happens than we do without it. 
Let's see if you get a better grade than I do. Right, let's see. I always give Sharon a better grade, 98 percent. No, I, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that sounds like an A-plus to me, Chad. <laughs> Got a little brown nose in the teacher over there, I think. Uh, Councilmember Allen. Thank you. I, I want to thank the sponsor both for bringing the original bill and for amending this to, to make it so that we can actually pass it, because um, this was the one big thing we heard from people, and I'm... I'm encouraged that we can hopefully offer some some solace on that. Um, can you just, so I can understand it in my brain's way, when we um, amend the section, whatever the section number is, is that the section that says this is allowed for these uses or this is prohibited for these uses? Yeah, this is one of those places where it's hard to tell without pulling up the Metro Code of Laws. Um, Director Darby can check me if I'm I'm wrong, but it basically the the this would add to the list of things um, that um, are not allowed to do. Okay, thank you. Any further committee discussion? Seeing none. We are on the amendment. Those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed. Any abstentions? All right, that is, uh, I think we're, yes. Eight in favor of the amendment, zero against, zero abstentions. And uh, on the bill as amended, any further? All right, those in favor? Aye. All right, those opposed? Any abstentions? All right, the bill is recommended as amended. Eight in favor, zero against. Thank you, Councilmember Mendez. And I believe that concludes our legislation for today. And now we have some folks from a small company operating in town called Google. Uh, and if they will come to the front, they wanted to present and share some updates and answer questions we have regarding the rollout of fiber, uh, especially as it relates to micro trenching. And uh, we uh, uh, will wait for them to join us at the front. And Councilmember Hurt, I'm going to work to try and find some extra credit uh, so I can get a higher grade than you. Okay, okay. You are, yes. And if y'all will, uh, you, all, the, all three of those mics are on, and so if y'all would introduce yourself, and uh, we do have a hard cutoff at five o'clock because we have other committees that we'll need to get to. Thank you. Council members, uh, we are more than pleased to uh, be before you today. Uh, today we're gonna go uh, over a high level uh, view of our build update for Nashville. Uh, and so in doing so, before I, before I get into the update, we want all the council members to know that Google Fiber as a, as a company is committed to our investment in Nashville. Uh, and so without any further ado, let's get right into it. I'll be going over uh, our introductions, our history of trench deployment uh, and the evolution in that space, the areas of proposed uh, relocation, our deployment process, which is really our build methodology, uh, door hangers, which is our communication and interaction with residents throughout Nashville, and our city micro trench specifications, and also our 2021-2022 progress to date. Um, also, uh, in, in saying that we are committed to our investment with Google, we also have some new faces that are in the market. Um, on this screen, you see six faces, uh, all of which are new, with an exception of Ed. <laughs> Ed has been here the longest. Uh, but I am Ryan Jackson. I'm the government and community affairs manager. Uh, to my left, uh, to your right, is our head of Metro Technical Operations, Ralph Newcomb. Um, our OG is our program manager lead, Ed Eckert. Um, our special projects manager, Bob Lilly, he's sitting in the back. Um, our head of sales, uh, Jason Dembowski, he couldn't be with here. He couldn't be with us here today, um, and also David Singer, uh, our technical operations lead. He's also sitting in the back. Uh, yes, uh, Ed Eckert, uh, program manager lead for. Um, 
the deployment here in Nashville, I've been uh, back in market here for about the last two years uh, so that we have a relatively young team here. Um, so we have um, a little bit of history here. So you're looking at uh, four areas that we deployed in uh, around uh, 20, uh, about 2017. We initially came to the market in 2015. Uh, we were pretty excited to, to launch here. A lot of excitement from uh, this community um, as well as Google Fiber. When we began to deploy, we ran into some issues. Uh, our preference is to be on the poles. Uh, so 90% of our plant, we would prefer to be on the poles and then about 10% would be underground. Unfortunately for us, uh, as time went on and we built for about a couple of years and around 2017, we began to realize that it was difficult to get on the poles because of uh, the incumbent providers uh, that were on the poles. Uh, there was a lot of congestion and so that required a lot of uh, movement uh, from the other providers. So therefore, um, we decided to uh, go underground with uh, kind of a modified micro trench um, um, deployment uh, process. Um, we worked with the city on this uh, because there was an excitement about us being able to deploy. We weren't able to get to the uh, to, uh, deploy into the metro as quickly as uh, folks wanted us to. So. Um, we launched in these uh, three, uh, four areas that you're looking up, uh, looking at right here, um, uh, underground. Uh, there was an issue with uh, this deployment method. Uh, it does come in conflict with uh, Mill and Pave uh, with the city, um, as well as it's not uh, um, optimal for us as well to, uh, for our customers. So after uh, this point, uh, a couple of years later, we re uh, relaunched in 2019, and this is where I came in. Uh, so uh, we worked with the city at a new depth uh, of trench, uh, micro trench, and uh, so we developed a standard with the city, and uh, that's on one of our slides here as well. Um, uh, but in the meantime, we want to go back uh, to these areas. These are some of the districts that we went into here, uh, six and seven, 21, 24, two, 19 and 20. So th those folks have experienced us coming through at one time. Our mission is to go back into these areas and to rebuild uh, these uh, four areas. In addition, we are still uh, deploying fiber in the rest of the Metro as well. Um, we have a f uh, approximately a uh, four-year plan on this, uh, so 25% of our builds are going into each of these areas. Uh, we are only gonna focus on one area at a time uh, with Mr. Jackson here. He's gonna work with uh, very closely with the council members in these particular districts, as well as our go-forward build plan that we're in process of, uh, of today. Uh, 2023, 24, 25, and 26, that's the approximate uh, timeline that we're anticipating to, to go through. The process uh, for these rebuild areas as well as our go forward plan uh, that we exist today, uh, we have a, a city uh, pre-construction review. Uh, we submit our permits, uh, permits uh, that we have utility locates uh, for water, uh, gas, uh, rarely AT&T and uh, some of the other folks at the other uh, utilities uh, because most of those, 90% of those are in the air. Uh, the city inspector walks uh, everything out with our uh, contractors, our supervisors, and uh and they determine whether or not uh, we should be in the hardscape, which is in the city road, or in the softscape. And so we want to avoid um, certain obstacles, uh, trees, uh, for example. Uh, so there's arborist concerns, so that uh, pushes us out into the roads. Um, after that walkout, we agree uh, where the deployment is going to be. Uh, we uh, put out our door hangers, uh, put out no parking signs. Um, we then build and restore in those uh, those neighborhoods. Uh, the uh, trench, and then once once that is completed, the inspectors, uh, city inspectors uh, go through the uh, project and uh, look to see if there's any issues um, that need to be remedied before we close out the permit. Uh, these are our um, door hangers. Uh, we door hang um, uh, 72 to 40 hours in advance. Um, our signage are out. 
out. Um, the, this indicates that we'll be in the area, there will be construction, there's a phone number on there for them to contact, uh, customer service uh, for construction issues. Uh, also, Mr. Jackson here works closely with the council members. We've learned that it's important to partner with our council members here uh, ahead of time so that you're aware of when we're coming into the area and when we're going to leave. Uh, in doing so, um, now we're able to uh, triage any issues uh, very quickly and then uh, you can uh, speak with your constituents in those areas as well, letting them know um, the, of any escalation issues. Uh, in addition, uh, we do take photos of, of every block that we're on uh, when we door hang. I know that there's uh, uh, sometimes uh, um, these uh, some folks that may not get a door hanger or uh, they may blow off or something or somebody else might grab them. Uh, so we do uh, provide these photos uh, to the city as well and they put it in their, um, in their records. This is the microtrench uh, standards and specifications that the city has uh, um, issued and uh, it's, uh, it's been revised a couple of times uh, to accommodate uh, uh, the appropriate depths and uh, to mitigate any issues with the city with mill and pave work. And, um, and that is it. Yeah, that, that concludes our presentation uh, to give a, a high level update of the bill. If there's any questions. Councilmember. Councilmember Cash. Thanks, I really appreciate you all coming and, and talking to us and I hope we can get, I, I, I got down some of the names, I hope we can get contact information before we leave. Sure. Um, I hear what you're saying about the hangers, but there are streets where that's not happening. Uh, I don't know what's happening with the pictures, if they're being recycled or what, but I've had numerous streets in my district that have not gotten the hangers. And not only that, I've had numerous streets that didn't get hangers and then got their cars towed. Um, so uh, I, I ask you to be like more diligent about making sure that these hangers are taking place. Um, Council member Cash, um, NDOT has been uh, a great partner with us and they've told us and communicated that some of these things have happened in council districts. Uh, we are aware of it, it's unacceptable, and we do look as we move forward to uh, tighten the loop on, on those uh, instances. Thanks, and um, so, and I appreciate that there's a, a, a government relations, is that the title, government relations uh, yes. person that's, that's here to help us, um, and I, I think if, if there were regular communications, either from y'all or from NDOT, like we're, we're, our emails are pretty easy to find, I'll give you mine um, before you leave. And like for a little while, uh, Roy Rowan, who's head of, you know, our right of way yes. and, and kind of over the, over the inspectors and uh, he was sending out like maps and here's where we're gonna be. I haven't gotten one of those in a while. So if we, yeah, if we, if we had like regular updates every week or every couple of weeks about, hey, here's what we're doing. Hey, here's the kind of routine of like, you know, the orange fake flower looking things are still sticking up. And I got people wondering, when are those going away? So if, like if we could get regular like FAQ, like right. if y'all are getting lots of questions, like kind of keep a record of the question and send them out so that you're not having to answer the same question over and over again. And we can just kind of see and go to those FAQs um, to, to answer questions for people. I've gotten a lot. Duly noted council member, and that's one of the reasons why we're here, to uh, strengthen that relationship. Thank you. Anyone else? Council member Withers. Thank you, Chair Young, for recognizing me, even though I'm not on the committee. And uh, But I like you, so I'll recognize you. Well, thank you. And welcome to the new new team members. I was serving on council last term when we had deliberation about uh, legislation that would have facilitated installing uh, fiber on utility poles, uh, and that was not successful in the courts. So here we are. Um, but so I, I noticed in the the chart that you provided that there would be some work that's planned in District Six and Seven, and and my colleague Emily Benedict and I represent that area. And of course, those were some of the earliest areas that were installed. Um, definitely, we have. Uh, I know I've experienced with street repavings where the mill machine goes down and everyone loses their stuff and uh, then uh, that leads for uh, um, 
an unpleasant couple of days um, <laughs> for everyone. So, um, but I wanted to get a, a little bit more, just more of a sense of what that rebuild activity might be looking like in those areas. Um, I have had NDOT work with y'all and, and other uh, fiber providers, uh, sometimes ahead of a, a repaving to increase the depth of, of where the fiber is installed before we do the repaving. That adds a little bit of front end time to the repaving, but it makes it more successful once it's in. And of course we hate to repave a street and then have it be torn up again. But I'm just wanting to know, is, is that kind of what you have in mind or would it be actually relocating the fiber from the street to utility poles in some cases or just kind of what it, what is what should we be expecting? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we do work with um, the um, Mill and Pave uh, team, uh, and so there, for example, this year we had about 113 uh, streets that they had given to us that were going to be milled. Uh, so we, and to, to your point, we did get out in front of those. Uh, out of those, I think uh, we're in these areas that were um, uh, presented on the slides. Um, um, uh, I think we were impacted on 15 of those streets. So we did get out in front of those. So it, it, it does look like uh, typical construction. It can take a little bit longer um, um, because we don't want to affect uh, the existing customers. And so we'll run them side by side. Uh, the new plant that we do install is uh, is, good, is much, much more robust. It's a lot easier to locate. Uh, and then it, it will be out of the mill and pave um, um, the machines, you know, in the future. So uh, no doubt downtime and so we're, we're, we're dealing with that. So we're out in front of that, so it's a two, two-fold thing uh, where we are uh, proactively going into each of these areas uh, to rebuild them, but at the same time each year, uh, or uh, when we do get these lists, then we're redesigning those areas out in front of the Mill and Pave team. Okay, thank you so much for that. Yeah, you're welcome. I just wanted to say that, uh, yes, council member, they, we do coordinate all of our paving activities with Google Fiber as well as all of the other utility companies so that we don't go out and pave a road and have it come back and torn up. So uh, they are coordinating effectively and keeping out in front of us. Thank you. You're welcome. Can, can Metro Water say the same, How, or Mr. Honeysucker, do you know or are and maybe that's a question better addressed to you folks. I apologize, I guess, as part of your communication with departments or we including Metro Water, especially when we've got water so lines we, that I think are getting hit. Right, so we meet uh, weekly, uh, so Metro Water um, and gas uh, with uh, the uh, with Rory's team and the city inspectors. We have a weekly stand-up meeting with them uh, to, to discuss issues and we have a two-week look ahead uh, to look uh, to, to address any issues at all. Uh, we do um, occasionally, you know, uh, some, some sometimes we do have uh, some issues out there where we cut, but uh, those are remedied uh, pretty quickly. I think it's a rare occasion, but it does happen. But we work very closely with uh, with with all with all utilities. All right. And in closing, uh, just to reference uh, that investment that I spoke about earlier, uh, these are the districts that we are currently building in right now. Uh, District 19, uh, it's Council Member Freddie O'Connell. District 17, Council Member. Colby Sledge, District 18, Council Member Tom Cash, who I just met. Uh, District 8, Council Member Nancy Van Rees. District 5, Council Member Sean Parker. District 11, Council Member Larry Hager. District 12, Council Member Aaron Evans. District 21, Council Member Brandon Taylor. This is just an example of our commitment to the investment of Nashville. Thank you. All right, uh, we certainly appreciate, a little bit, blah, 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 yeah. Certainly appreciate you, Mr. Jackson, your colleagues and team uh, for, for providing that to us. I think uh, what it sounded like today might make sure, especially to the, the uh, especially Council Member Cash, maybe send out s some contact information to the council. Um, and then actually what I think might be beneficial to send all the council is if you have, uh, even if you're shooting from the hip on your projected times on these different areas throughout the county. Uh, but we. Appreciate you coming and thank you very much. Thank you. And we are adjourned.